A very warm welcome to all our listeners. My name is Maria Fondes, and um, I'll wait, I will be your presenter for the evening. I am originally from Chile, but I have been in the UK for most of my life. And um, in the past few years, I have been coordinating the Brahma Gumaris Environment Initiative in London, which aims to create a greater awareness of the environment within our community. I was fortunate enough to attend the COP26 in Glasgow with um, our distinguished speakers. And for those of you who may not know, COP stands for Conference of the Parties. And it refers to the different nations of the world assembling together to discuss and agree on the issues of uh, climate change. So be before we begin the conversation, I will briefly introduce our guest speakers. So we have Sister Genti, and she's additional administrative head of the Brahma Kumaris. She is the NGO representative of the Brahma Kumaris to the UN in Geneva and the leader of the Brahma Kumaris delegation to the UN climate change conferences. And then we have Golo Pils. And Golo is of German origin and has been living in India since the early 1990s. Golo is a Brahma Kumaris advisor on renewable energy and has established the Brahma Kumaris as one of the major uses, users of renewable energy in India. And last but not least, Sonia Olson from Denmark. And she is the designated contact point to the United Nations Framework Conven Convention on Climate Change, otherwise known as UNFCCC. She is also the international coordinator for the, for the Brahma Kumaris Environment Initiative and the director of Brahma Kumaris in Denmark. So our speakers have been attending the UN climate change conferences since 2009. And this evening they're here to share with us their experiences of COP26. So firstly, Sister Genti, what did you find different or special about COP26? I'd like to share a greeting of peace with all the viewers, my brothers and my sisters, Om Shanti. And I was very grateful that we are living in a democracy in this country, because as far as I know, this is the first time that COP has been held in the UK. And it was quite an amazing vision to see the power of protest from the people. So many people coming together in Glasgow from many different places, I imagine, but they were there every single day, morning, afternoon, and evening, trying to put across their message and their point. And I'm sure that anybody attending COP would, wouldn't have missed seeing them. And so it, it was good to see that very robust um, opposition to what's going on and prompting governments to take major action to bring about change and transformation. That was one thing that struck you immediately. And the police were very calm in dealing with them. It was, it was good. The police were, I think there were, must have been 10,000 police on duty. That was what I'd read at one point. But they were very good natured and the protesters were also very good natured. And so everything happened very calmly and peacefully, but the point was made very powerfully. And also I found that this time, um, over the years, it's gradually been growing, but especially this time now, spirituality and meditation were words that people were waiting to hear. It was like they felt relief when we talked about meditation and talked about how there can be empowerment through meditation. And so this was um, a very welcome change, but also not just in terms of the people we were meeting, but generally 
in terms of the environmental movement because earlier on people from the environment movement didn't really feel that religion or spirituality had much to contribute but now they were wanting people from faith based organizations to come on their platform and share those ideas so i think that that whole subject of consciousness lifestyle awareness and the connection with trying to keep temperatures down to a point where we won't see more disasters is something that people are finding relevant now thank you sister genti so um in terms of um uh, the climate change conferences uh, golo you have been involved in these for the past 10 years and can you tell us a little bit about the current situation regarding climate change well um, we all must be aware that we are in a quite dramatic situation right now um we heard about the various research papers which have been published and uh, i remember in bonn a paper was published uh, called the hot house earth um by the potsdam climate research institute and other organizations in which the danger was described that the earth may slide into a unstable um situation and warming cannot be stopped a little bit later um another report dramatic report was published by the major research organizations uh called the 10 uh, points of climate change the 10 tipping points in climate mm. and everybody can actually google that up and can read the reports by himself in which was described that the earth is like a living organism and um, there are 10 major systems like ice sheets um the forests um the reefs the monsoon and the circulation system which actually control our climate and if one of these system gets unstable it may affect all the others and lead to a cascading effect in the climate and then this time at the climate conference um the leading i think 50 scientists from 20 countries all from the leading research institute they published a paper called the 10 insights into the climate and in the gist we can say we have to stay below 1.5 degree otherwise um it might be very well possible that we slide into a new equilibrium let's say 3 or 4 degree or these tipping points are getting triggered and the climate goes out of control and if we see the news of the last uh, weeks and month uh, just uh, last week there was very very serious flooding in canada now in the summer they had in vancouver 49 degrees now they had serious flooding mm-hmm. and when i left india 2 weeks ago the whole monsoon had been shifted by 4 weeks to 6 weeks behind so we can see already um a very dramatic shift in climate it's affecting already the life of millions of people of farmers of business people uh, all around the world and um we have to take this on a very very urgent um call we have to see this as a very urgent call for us to change our lifestyle the way how we run our economy the way how we generate electricity and uh, the whole way how we use the resources of the planet and this has been made very very clear and uh, science scientists told us also at this conference that basically we have 10 years time to reduce or to half our carbon emission then we will be on a trajectory for let's say 1.5 degrees and this is a very very um challenging task because uh, here we in the west uh, for us to half our carbon emissions uh, would be a tremendous task in 10 years but that is what scientists told us so the outlook is quite clear we're in a very mm-hmm. dramatic situation we have to act mm-hmm. immediately or we have to face the consequences of an un controllable climate change it's true it's very very serious is and it seems to getting to be getting more and more serious all the time some say so. it's uh, even an exponential development so it's high time and scientists made it very very clear it's very important that the world recognizes that isn't it uh, now i like to ask sonia um what what stood out for you personally at this cop going back to cop <laughs> Thank you Maria. 
Sarah for the introduction and for the good questions you have. Uh, what stood out for me was especially two things. One was the preparations and uh, it became clear only six weeks before the climate change conference was going to take place that it will be in person uh, mm -hmm. conference mm -hmm. and that means the preparation got so intense what we normally have four six months to do we had to do in six weeks and so that most very tight deadlines and to arrange a conference in uh, in a pandemic world is also a bit of a large-scale project mm -hmm. and we had tremendous many guidelines we have to read nearly sent to us every every day and uh, the whole logistical management to get the whole team tested for COVID every day and you have to show a negative test to enter the venues and then to upload this negative test on the NHE app and because of restrictions of number of people could be in every room we have to book and register for every event we wanted to go so it's heaps of tickets for every person Mm -hmm. And then we went hybrid, which was a fantastic event because it meant that all of you who are also listening now could be listen to some of our programs, be part of it. But to prepare for hybrid, it's also a double work. You have to prepare mm -hmm. physical and for digital. And for our exhibitions, for example, they were both physical and, and digital. So that was very intense period which stood up. I haven't tried that before. The other one was, um, as you both are mentioning, is critical times and people are becoming more and more aware of the urgency. And it also means that the fear is increasing, the worry, the anxiety, the depression of the world disappearing in front of your eyes, that is increasing. And when 40,000 people come together, in one city, this anxiety becomes very tangible. Mm. And But I had experiences together, sometimes on my own and sometimes with my interfaith colleagues, to, to be able to experience people's anxiety and hold the pain for a while. Mm. And then replace it with love and compassion and peace. Mm. And my experience was also together with other people who do the same practice from their faith, that when you can hold the pain of people and being a witness to it at the same time as experience love, then healing takes place. So that was very special. And it's also happened with the youth, you know, because it's a grief for the youth. They're seeing their future being ripped away from them and to be able to hold the grief and then replace it with love and compassion it was a very strong experience. That's a very beautiful experience indeed. And um, I feel that um, the task of spreading that love and um, a, a certain kind of um, stability and peace and uh, compassion that, that is probably where the meditators um, have their their role. And um, so I like to ask Sister Genti, um, what is the message of the BKs and how well was the spiritual message uh, received at this COP? I mean, you already mentioned a little bit about spirituality, but then what is the message that the BKs are giving at COPs? We've taken up the subject of consciousness and climate since 2009. And at first people used to, you know, um, have quizzical eyebrows and say, what's this? And we'd explain to them and they would be able to get it within 90 seconds. It's a very simple understanding that what's going on inside is then what you express through your words and your behavior, your actions, and that is what impacts the world around you. And so when I have a spiritual perspective, a consciousness that's clean and pure and elevated, then what I'm doing is treating the world, people, and other forms of life and nature itself with respect, recognizing that it's sacred. Life is sacred, not just for humans, but also for other beings, but definitely also for everything within this planet. 
And so when you begin to see nature as sacred, there's a very different relationship you have with nature. You're not in the mode of aggression or exploitation or simply taking, but rather you're able to give something to nature. You're able to support nature. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that, again, if you look at things from a spiritual dimension and have that awareness of the inner consciousness, you realize that you carry within yourself all the treasures, the treasures of peace, of love, of truth, of happiness. And that shifts your relationship with the world out there in the sense that you don't need to go to the, to the Bahamas on holiday to be able to experience happiness. You can stay right where you are and find the happiness within you. Just imagine how many carbon miles and how small your carbon footprints become if you're aware of that. So um, where we chase around and it becomes very much a consumer society, it is that. Um, but where we think that buying things is going to bring us happiness and security and all the things that we long for, and you realize that that's actually not true. You can have 12 pairs of shoes in your closet and still not be happy. And somebody can have maybe just one pair of shoes and they're very happy. So connecting with the happiness that's within you means that your life is a very simple one. Your carbon footprint has been reduced hugely. And also you're able to change your lifestyle, your your food, your drink, all of this becomes plant-based because you value life and the sanctity of life. So the shift that happens with spirituality is a very important one in terms of being able to contribute to the world in a very positive way rather, in a ne rather than in a negative way. So I found that this message was very much appreciated. Um, you see, one of the things about lifestyle is that people feel that it's a huge sacrifice to change things in their life, like your diet. And yet when you're experiencing that inner joy, and also you know that all forms of life are sacred, then you don't want to kill for the sake of food. You don't want to aggress the planet. You want to be able to live in harmony and peace with everyone and everything around you. So spirituality is, I think, really one of the keys to being able to provide solutions without costing anything. Mm -hmm. um, really a true contribution to helping the earth move in the right direction. Yes, it seems like a very practical thing to do that um, everyone can do. When you mentioned about the pairs of shoes and you can have one pair and be happy, I remember the children that I've seen in India jumping around the rocks, the soil, and being so happy playing their little games with little sticks and little stones and all of that. And they're so happy and they don't have shoes. And so... Yeah, they just have enough to live, but they're very, very happy. So it is a fact that we don't need all the comforts of the modern world to be happy. So um, coming back to the COP, um, what is, um, I'm going to ask Golo now, what is your take on this COP? And you have been working as an expert in renewable energies and how urgent is this situation now regarding the climate crisis that relates to the other question. Well, the Brahma Kumaris started 25 years ago to embark on a renewable energy project, I can say, and we started um, to do research in um, solar cooking, to do research in small power packs for rural application. And uh, I was able to make some contact with the German government. We got some funding and we started very, very small with very tiny systems, very modest. Mm -hmm. And slowly, slowly, um, we did bigger projects. We developed solar steam cooking systems for institution. Um, we developed solar photovoltaic power systems for houses and then a little bit bigger systems. And we were able to roll out these um, programs into our centers. 
The Brahma Kumaris has around 5,000 meditation centers in India, and I'm very glad that around five, six, the exact number I even don't know, five, six, seven hundred have installed a solar system on their rooftop and are either producing hot water by the sun or electricity. And India is a country which has problems with the electrical grid. We have power cuts quite often and so on. And such a system then comes very, very handy and helps actually to have a stable power. So um, renewable energy was a important um, step for us to go in the direction to have more energy independence. On the other side, it is also something which um, goes very well with our philosophy to stay in harmony with nature, to stay in harmony with the self and stay in harmony with nature, because renewable energy is a sort of clean technology to a great extent. Mm. Um, in the last years, then, we did a very big project um, with the German and the Indian government. It's uh, India One. It's a one megawatt solar thermal power station, and it features thermal storage as a speciality and the transition to this um, need the needed transition to clean technology depends to a great extent on storage sometimes we have uh, sunlight and we have enough sun and in the night we don't have sunlight so how to produce electricity for example this electricity here comes most likely now from a power station and not from renewables until and unless the wind generators run full force, which is not always the case. So storage and distribution are the critical areas. And that is where we do research since the last 20 years with the German and the Indian government. And we carried out many research programs. And around three years ago, we inaugurated also our India One project, um, which is based on 770 dishes, which concentrate and focus the sunlight onto receivers and we run a one megawatt turbine for 24 mm -hmm. hours. It's a bit technical, isn't it? But It's a bit technical. It but sounds I very mean, great, hope, but I, I thank hope, you for I that. Hope, I know I, people will understand, no doubt. I hope there are <laughs> some technical people in the audience and understand that too. And uh, so um, it was very important for us to go in that direction and combine actually a spiritual lifestyle also with a scientific approach to help solve mm -hmm. the problems. Beautiful. And I also would like to mention that we did a lot of training and education. Um, we invited um, engineers from all over India and we did more than 30 seminars and training workshops and also conferences. We um, like to upgrade their skills, train them in solar technologies. We also network with all the major universities in India, also with other organizations. And our aim is to spread this technology and make it available for everybody. And most of our technology is available free. You can just come, learn it and copy it. And uh, in context to the COP, yes, it is absolutely necessary that we switch to renewable energies. Um, it, we, we have been told that uh, within around five, there are around 5,000 coal-based power plants globally at the moment running. And I heard the number that 2,500 have to be switched off within the next 10 years. And that's a big challenge in how you replace that power generation. Mm -hmm. And their renewable can play a vital role. And the good news is the technology is out. Mm -hmm. It is proven. Um, the concept, the idea, the technology, everything is there since years. And it's actually just uh, the willpower and the dynamism. The finances? Which is, the finances also, <laughs> yeah. But you see, the long-term costs of not acting are much, much higher. Yes. Already now, the damages are exorbitant of yes. not acting. And I agree. All the big players, they know it already, that it's becoming more costly to wait. So the markets are shifting already and um, big investment decisions are now falling in favor of renewable energy. The only issue is it takes time to build such large-scale systems. That's the problem we are now facing. Mm, thank you. Otherwise, everything is there. Thank you for that. And uh, just to add that I know many centers around the world have also followed the example of India. I know lots of centers and um, so they've installed solar panels to give them clean energy, which is really wonderful. Um, so I like to go over to Sonia now and ask um, could you tell us a little bit uh, about some of the main activities of the Brahma Kumaris at this COP? 
Our activities they focus around a few areas, and Sister Gente Hingolo have mentioned some of them. It's like from inside out and outside in. <laughs> you have the awareness and also the climate action in, for, in form of renewable energy. And we work with the interfaith uh, community on topics like resilience, adaptation, mm. hope. We work with the youth. It's, it's a lot. We are very active in the youth, and they talk about inner well-being, about uh, the values, the needed for the future, and then we have the energy transition topics, and we have a big, a very big active team. And I wish they could all be here this evening and share this evening with us, but it's not possible. And some of the activities you have the official UN area. And there we had some press conferences. One was called Resilience in Urgent Times. And one was called Visionary Leadership. And we do these press conferences together with partners and collaborators. And uh, we had the program on feminine uh, leadership for a sustainable world in the Sustainable Development Goal Pavilion a program on energy transition in the EU pavilion and we had also a program in um, yeah there is another public in the WWF Panda Hub mm -hmm. so which have a, a new uh, uh, area of faith and nature and then uh, parallel to this official UN area you have a big conference area hosted by the UK government and they also run parallel side events and exhibition. And there we had a two-day exhibition. And that was a very good experience for me and for the team because you come very close to people. And it's people from all over the world, but also local from Scotland. And you have time to talk to them. And they come and pick up our blessing cards. They like the 10 ways to change the world. And many could very quickly... I pick up the connection between meditation and renewable energy. And there's time to talk and people listen to people's concerns and worries and ideas like that. And then parallel to that, there is another level of activity, which is the civil society. So the civil society in the UK have gone together and they have a one week forum, people summit where people who are not uh, often not have um, accreditation to the UN zone, but they have their own people summit. And there are many people from Glasgow and Scotland in general participated. So we had a few programs there on energy transition, on uniting hearts and interfaith programs. And we also arranged our, our own programs there. And you see... Community building is very important at the moment. Mm. But at the same time, the platforms for the civil society to interact with people is shrinking. The, the, the financial support from governments is becoming less. The, the venues are becoming less. The different uh, platforms for interacting with people is less and less. But people have this urgency to meet and to be together and build communities. We saw that in, in, in COP26, many thought they would not come due to COVID and due to late notice, etc. But then when the word was out, many changed their mind and we were 40,000 people at the end because people just have a need to meet. So this community building is a very important factor and there you, you have to be purpose-driven, you need transparency, you need a lot of time, and there I find meditation and spirituality supporting. And then at last, but not the least, is then the youth. And mm. uh, We have very active youth delegation. And actually before COP26, the youth meet. It's called the COI conference, conference of youth. And they get together and they network and they prepare how to best contribute to the COP conference which is coming after. So we had a, a special youth delegation there and they run a, a well-being space with daily meditations, etc. It sounds like uh, there were lots of activities happening all the time. And I heard that there were about 
30 events that the Brahma Kumaris were involved in. Yeah, it was actually ended up more than that by the end of the day. But yeah. 30 plus. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, mm. thank you, Sonia. Mm. So now uh, back to Sister Genti. Um, also continuing with the subject of the activities of the Brahma Kumaris, um, I wonder uh, what activities that you took part in COP26 stood out for you, and do you have any memorable moments? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one particular memorable moment was, well, it was half a day actually, um, Maria and myself, we were both together in the Blue Zone and we had a media interview that was organized by WWF, the World Wildlife Fund. And then we had to get across from the Blue Zone, the government place, to the UK um, public space and that was the Green Zone and we went across there and um, we were facing the wind and the rain and it was quite dramatic the way it was all happening. And then from there, we had to go to the BBC studios, which um, just imagine a huge, huge place and just a handful of people in that place. It almost felt like a ghost town. Um, COVID meant that most people were working not from the offices in the studio, but probably from home. And in fact, then um, it was a program called the Sunday program, which is the main religious program on BBC Radio 4. And it was fascinating because um, there was a bishop from Panama. He was the bishop of Panama. So he was sitting in one studio. I was sitting in another studio. And the person who was interviewing us happened to be in Manchester. Um, and so we were all in different places, but the conversation was a very rich conversation and it was just about the whole subject of, well, if faith-based organizations are not given a platform um, within the government plenaries, how are the governments going to listen to the voices? And it happened to be the same day, which was going to be the global protest day. And in fact, we'd seen people preparing for that. And I knew that a hundred thousand people were going to be marching just in Glasgow alone. So my response was that um, governments have to listen to people. And so people are now demanding action that's going to bring justice for all, that's going to bring benefit for all, and they're really wanting to see change happen. And so it was just a five-minute interview that was broadcast on the Sunday, but it was a, a very interesting lead-up to that whole thing with the interview. And then when we left the studio and came back to Queen Street, which is where we had to catch our train to go back, um, we found ourselves right in the middle of this huge, huge procession and protesters marching. But the atmosphere was like a carnival. It was really people singing and dancing and literally physically dancing in the streets. Um, they were making their point, but they were really enjoying it. And there were three people from the Brahma Kumaris who were also on the march with them. It was just interesting to catch a glimpse of that and to see how we're in a different time period now when people's voices are being made to be heard, whether it's through social media or through this um, possibility of coming together as community from all parts of the world. So that was an, a very fascinating day to both participate in and also to observe and lots of other memories. But one other particular memory was um, when we again had a meeting with the um, deputy chair of UN C F C, and this was a man who we'd been meeting the last few years, and we were presenting what was called um, the call from the Talanoa Dialogue, and the Talanoa Dialogue started about five years ago when Fiji partnered with Bonn to be able to do the climate change conference in Bonn itself, but it was the Fiji government that was organizing it with the German government. And so the dialogue was a very specific one. Where have we come from? What is it that we hope to achieve? And how will we make it happen? And so 
um, there had been about 200 people from a variety of different faiths and no faith background coming together to have discussions. And out of that um, discussions of several hours, then the call that was prepared was presented to this individual. And he was, he knew most of us and he was happy to see us all again. Um, and then we asked him, well, how can we support your work and in what way can you help us amplify our voices? And he was very clear and he said, meet the communications people in my department, which we did. And so there seems to be a lot of cooperation between individuals who can make a difference at the UN, but also the faith-based organizations and all the other people from civil society. So that was again a very memorable moment. Many others, but I'm sure there's many other things that others will share. So we'll, we'll keep the ball rolling around and, and continue to share. So I'd like to ask uh, Golo next. Um, we, we've been experiencing dramatic changes in, in the world today. And how has your spirituality helped you in adjusting to this? Uh, that's an interesting question. I came first time to India in 1985. And um, I saw this great, great potential in India for renewable energies like uh, sun, pure. Mm. And um, I thought, wow, we can do something. On the other side, I saw the ongoing deforestation. I saw also a lot of poverty. And I thought, wow, we can do something here. And uh, I started thinking on uh, technical solutions. And uh, very quickly I realized that is only half side of the coin because as a German to do something in India is a challenge. <laughs> um, I had to Indianize myself. I'm one of the Indianized Germans now. You know, I became very soft. I learned the Indian head shake, which <laughs> still I cannot really explain what it means, but it's very important. And uh, I understood that this transformation of technology which is required or which or this introduction of technology is required has to support has to be supported by my own spiritual journey and development because i have to learn compassion tolerance love um, i had to forget about being arrogant that i know things or this and that because that all would not help me so it all you all it all comes back to basic human values, which I had to learn to embark on a journey and to sort of deal with values, ethics, and make that part of the bringing in the renewable energies, you know? And um, so I had many beautiful experiences over the years. Um, and uh, one of the highlights was, of course, meeting the daddies. Uh, Brahma Kumar is, is administrated by women and uh, Daddy Janki was, until last year, she left us. She was the head of the institution and a great, great example and inspiration for me. And I remember whenever I came to Daddy, and I said, Daddy, there's a technological problem. Daddy, we have no money. Or Daddy, this guy is not is very is not helping me. And Daddy said, Don't worry. Daddy will send good vibrations. And I could feel um, when she sort of sent her power to you to support you, and that inspired me in return to do it in the same way. So bringing renewable energies to the institution was bringing spirituality to myself. And it was actually a combination of both. And um, in the climate change, I feel it is a very important method which we are able to offer to the people because it is time to build up inner resilience, to build up inner strength, um, to deal with this climate chaos and these times we are right now in. There's tons of information out in the internet, in social media, is that this, at that. And when you are actually in a meeting or in a conference, your phones, all the phones of the people around you, they make beep, beep, boop, boop, blip, blip, blip. <laughs> and all the people are taking their phones and they're going somewhere else. And I heard that the average attention span of a person is seven seconds, you know, because partly because of that. And I feel meditation is a very powerful tool to bring back 
concentration and willpower to us to deal with that situation which is ahead of us because we have really we need our all our willpower and all our strength for this coming transformation and uh, my experience of the last 30 years is meditation has helped me to be relaxed even if something goes wrong i told myself okay <laughs> It has to happen like that. And uh, it helped me to become another person. And it helped me to be successful in the introduction of good technology and doing good things for the planet. So I felt this combination. And I try to share that also when I'm at the climate conference as a, as a means of going forward. And um, recently we have uh, introduced a, a new platform that's called Yogis for Future. Everybody is welcome to have a look, yogisforfuture.org. And it's a web page where we have uploaded free meditation for everybody. And this meditation is for the self to strengthen the self, but it's also to heal the relations between you and others. And there are meditations also to send blessings to nature and heal nature. Because what we all know is nature is reacting to our attitude and to our thoughts. And there's a very, very in, there's a very, very strong relation between what happens on the inside and what happens outside there. So we have set up this Yogis for Future platform and um, wherever we gave, we made little bookmarks. And whenever we gave these bookmarks out, people said, oh, yes, that's very good. I will have a look. So we could feel there's also a welcoming of this kind of method to move ahead. People really would like to change and they really look like for means and methods and input to do so. So that was sort of my experience of the spirituality at the COP. Mm, thank you, Bruno. <clears throat> it seems very interesting, this uh, connection between spirituality, values, and what you need to achieve, because this was the way to achieve what you have achieved in terms of renewable energy. Um, but I find it very interesting that th you understood that and this is how you were able to achieve everything that's been achieved. Well, I was also very lucky and there was blessings and help from above. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And, and I feel that this is really the way forward for everybody, for anything positive that we want to achieve in our lives. So... Um, so coming back to Sonia, um, I don't have a, a, another question immediately, but I'm thinking, is there anything else that you would like to add to whatever has been said? Yes, I like to, to what add, you've said. I'd like to add a little game or a, an activity. And one of our favorite activities at COP has been for the last many, many years is our blessing cards. And we have 10 cards like this. They come 10 ways, 10 values that can help you to change the world. And often in our stands, we have, we used to have stacks of paper and position paper. Nowadays, everything is digital. But, and then we have a box of these blessing cards and people come by the stand every day to take only this card, a positive card for the day to keep focus mm -hmm. and they leave all the writing behind and I find that these cards have created so much positivity and in this time in COP when we had the exhibition I used to go around to the other exhibitors with all these cards in my hand and said would you like to take a positive card to create a good day at the exhibition mm -hmm. oh yeah I like and you create so much good atmosphere and people were so happy for these cards. Mm. And if they took open the heart, for example, I could say, now you can open the heart of every one person that comes to your stand. And then people have a task, a positive task. So it creates a lot of happiness. And actually one of my experiences that stood up was we, have a, we had a small program about meditation, yogis for future. And we were free from the big case. The local pastor and a new person, totally new person turned up. We were only five. But we used this card to uh, pull a value which would help me in my changing my habits today and which would guide me for the future. And we had such deep discussions. Mm -hmm. And I feel sometimes it's not the number, but it is the depth you reach with a few people because they will go out in their community and spread it and do the same. Mm 
So I thought here this evening I would actually pull a card for all of you here in the audience and all of you also, which card would help us to take our initiative forward so for one next card COP. For all of us. One card for all of us. Yeah, go on, go on. But uh, <laughs> I've turned it the opposite way because I know what's behind all of this. I turned them the back way so I wouldn't be able to see. And it's only it's 10 cards, so one value each. So now I take it, the destiny will decide what to focus on. And Surprise. I think I'll take this one. All right. <laughs> it's empowering yourself. Yeah, my capacity to help create a sustainable future expands enormously when I tap into my spiritual power. So I think uh, with the, the word used for empowering in the COP is often resilience, the inner strength, the inner power to face whatever may come. And here is a very clear message that uh, if I tap into my own inner power, I will be able to face whatever comes mm. and with, my, with that power. But I will also be able to keep the vision of where I'm going. So maybe we can use that to keep the vision of that beautiful earth we all want in our hearts to always keep that in front of us. And the more detailed my vision of the future is, the more likely I am to achieve it. And then to take this inner power and also power, divine power, to face whatever may come in the near future. I think that's very beautiful, Sonia. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that our audience will be also grateful because it's almost like everybody has received an inspiration yeah. and, and the power. I think you can download them. Yeah, these cards are available on the inter, on the, our Echo web page, which you will have the the link to after this program, so you can see them there. Yes, when when we finish, there is usually a, an end slide. Yeah. So yeah. the um, address for our Echo website will be yeah. there, yeah. and on that Echo website. Uh, anybody will be able to find the cards, yeah. the 10 ways to change mm -hmm. the world, mm -hmm. um, the reports for mm -hmm. our activities in the COP, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, lots of things, mm -hmm. uh, most of the activities mm -hmm. that we've been doing. And um, I like to add also that when I was um, at the exhibitions, um, I found the same as you, Sonia, that um, people love these 10 ways to change the world. and. Uh, there are so many experiences, um, friendships made, um, conversations, sharings uh, with people of different ages, different mm -hmm. backgrounds mm -hmm. from different parts of the world, like you said. And there was a lady that came, a young lady that came and saw the poster and she went straight into the stand and stood in front of the poster and she stayed there for a long time. We had a long conversation. Mm -hmm. She wanted to know each one of the 10 ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, she's had lots of ideas of mm -hmm. an exhibition she would like to have of the 10 ways mm -hmm. and so gave us some ideas for the future. But yes, it's a very beautiful opportunity to connect with people, make friendships. So, um, um, we still have um, maybe five more minutes. Gente, ben, Sister Genti would like to say something else. Golo maybe adds anything. One of, the, one of the sessions that I participated in that stays in my mind very, very clearly was the one that was organized at the um, SDG stand, the Sustainable Development Goals. And um, it was a couple of yeah. women from the University of East Anglia, and it was uh, a woman who'd come from an indigenous tribe in Orissa in India, and myself, and a woman from Austria. So very different backgrounds, and within the two women um, who were from East Anglia, um, one was a professor, and the other one who came with her was a young woman from Sudan who was her postgraduate student studying for her doctorate. Um, so it was a, a big variety of people there. And I was fascinated by the whole subject of feminine leadership, but also indigenous leadership, um, because 
Of course, the SDG goals talk about gender rights and equality and so on. But within this, what I understood was how um, indigenous ways are very much related to the cycles of nature and people who are in touch with nature and the earth and the elements of the world are perhaps more in harmony with the elements and so have um, a great sense of what signals they're picking up from nature. And of course, what they were saying is that we've been ignoring all the signals that we've been getting from nature. And it's so important to come back to that awareness of what is it that the indigenous people can offer us at this moment? And then in terms of feminine leadership, um, our own organization, when it started, the founder had decided that um, what he would like is a world of justice, of equality. And of course, gender equality was a big topic in 1936. Um, women didn't, especially in the state where he was from, which was um Sindh state in, Had uh, in pa what is today Pakistan, but at that time it was the whole of India together. And so what he noticed was that women had a very secondary role in society. And what he offered was the opportunity for women to become spiritual leaders and teachers, which was quite a revolutionary step to take in those days. But today also what I'm finding is that I'm not just talking about women as such, but the feminine qualities that are needed, the compassion, the love, the care, the nurture that's needed. And so I think that if we want to bring about a change within the systems that exist in the world now, I think we need to look at the whole subject of justice and how to be able to make that happen. And that applies on so many different levels, whether it's racial justice, whether it's climate justice, whether it's um, any other type of justice. So it was a fascinating conversation that we had that evening. And um, it was a very powerful experience. Thank you for that. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned about respect, respect for nature, I think that this word is a very deep and very important word, that if we have respect even for the self, for others, for nature, for everything that exists, then the world would be very, very different. And this is one of the things that Aborigines uh, or Indigenous people have, is they have a sense of respect for everything that exists and they don't consider anything to be their own, but but to be almost like uh, on loan. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they know the way to preserve those uh, systems of nature as well. So, yes, uh, I also find that a very fascinating subject. Anyone would like to yeah. add something or shall we? Um, i like to Say share thank you. finally and at the end. Um, I feel it's very important uh, that we all stay positive and yes. optimistic in these times. Um, thank you. At that. the climate conference, um, a lot of people had been worried um, because of the outlook. Um, I feel optimism happiness, joy is very fundamental to stay healthy, but also to take right decision and have the power to act. This is very, very mm -hmm. important. And um, I would like to share also a bit about Indian wisdom. In India, we believe that we are now in the age of Kali, the age where all the karma comes up in form of climate change and so many other problems. But in front of us lies a new age, which is the age of truth, the Satyuga. And uh, I feel this is also a message of hope that this crisis is a chance for all of us to transform and something good will, born, will be born out of that. And I think this is a message which is important so people don't get desperate about the situation. Thank you for that. It is indeed very important. Yeah, m one experience I had, we were very lucky to stay on the countryside. We were right out on in the Scottish Highlands and when we woke up in the morning, we looked out on the fields where the sheep were grassing and uh, there were horses, etc., and lots of trees. And I, I had many times the experience of connecting to nature to calm down a bit from the stress and the bus. Sometimes we spend four hours in traffic and the conference area is so noisy. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And just to to look up on the blue sky from time to time or go and talk to the horses, then uh, you suddenly remember why we're at COP and you're reminded of breathing and breathing in peace and connecting to yourself, connecting to God, connecting to the global family, connecting to the earth. <sighs> And then for me, often the feeling comes, okay, everything will be all right. Oh, yes, of course. And uh, so that's all I think I find very important for everybody and to take time to stop from time to time to look at the flower or to look at the blue sky and just reconnect to yourself, to God, to the world and take a deep breath. <laughs> yes, that's very important. I agree. Um so I think that um, we've had a very inspiring and enriching conversation. Thank you so much to our speakers. And I'm sure our listeners have also enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Uh, special thanks also to all those involved in organizing this event and in providing technical help to make it possible. Thank you so much. And to close the session, I would like to request the Sister Genti to grace us with a meditation, as is the way that we end our events at Brahma Kumaris. Thank you, Sister Genti. Thank you, Mary. Yes, thank you. Just sit quietly, comfortably. And I'll share a few thoughts as I reflect and invite you to follow those ideas. Going within, reflecting on the things that I've been hearing about, respect, compassion, cooperation, love, peace, truth, beautiful ideas and beautiful thoughts. But as I reflect on some of these words, respect, where can I find it? Where does it exist? And just for a short while, I can feel the respect that lies within within my own inner world. Respect that arises from knowing who I am, knowing my own core values that lie within. I realize that I don't need to look for these things outside. My values lie within me and connected with these values, I actually begin to experience them. My thoughts become very calm very peaceful, but pure, elevated. And even energized by the things I have been hearing. When I see the beauty of these inner core values, I see that every living being has these qualities within them 
and so every human life and all forms of life are sacred. Realizing this, I respect all human beings, all forms of life. And the vibrations of respect reach out not only to my human family, but also to all forms of life. And as they feel respect reaching them, they become calm and supportive. They are no longer angry with us. No longer working against us. But they feel safe. And so they cooperate. And the vibrations of respect reach the elements, all the elements of nature that have supported us since the beginning of time and shared abundance with us. Together with respect, I offer nature my gratitude. Holding this awareness, I come back to the moment here and now. I resolve to stay in this awareness of respect. Om Shanti. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful and empowering meditation. And it really transported me back to the days of COP when we used to meet every morning, early morning, the whole delegation meeting together for meditation. That was really one of my highlights as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening.